Welcome to Park Church. Merry Christmas. My name is Matt. I'm a pastor here on staff, and it's really exciting to see all of you here. Uh, thank you for being here. We know that um, there's a lot going on on Christmas. During the Christmas season, people are busy. There's plans. There's dinners. Uh, it, I'm glad that you were here on Christmas Eve rather than somewhere else because this is a good place to be. I think I have some good news to share with you uh, this evening. Uh, Thank you also to everyone who has done something to make this service happen. The musicians, the uh, flowers, the people who coordinated the kids, all the hospitality. Thank you. Let's just give everyone a hand real fast. So throughout this Christmas season, uh, if you haven't been here over the last few weeks, that's okay. I know there's a lot of people who are visiting from other places, maybe visiting from out of town, or you don't usually come here. Uh, it is really great that you are here. We are happy that you are here. Uh, but if you haven't been here, we want you to know a little bit about what's been going on. We've been doing a sermon series called Home for Christmas. We've been talking about the ways that when God was born in the manger at Bethlehem in Jesus, uh, it's like God coming into our lives and the different things that God calls us to and the way that God changes us and the way that God means to make a difference in our lives. Um, we've been kind of looking at uh, one passage, and I kicked off this series like this a few weeks ago, looking at this passage from the Gospel of John. Uh, this was one of the four books written about Jesus' life and ministry. The Gospel of John, he writes this. He says, so the word, and the word is John's way of referring to God and to Jesus, the word became human and made his home among us. That is, when Jesus was born in that manger, surrounded with the shepherds and angels and the animals and whatnot, that little baby is God. God in the flesh, the same flesh that you and I have right there. And so it's not a stretch to say that at Christmas, on that first Christmas, God comes home to be a human, to be with us. And that's the miracle. And he comes as a baby. Now, a few weeks back, you might remember, if you were here again, uh, I told you that we were expecting a baby, my wife and I, five weeks ago. And lo and behold, a week ago today, we had a baby. <laughs> Uh, little Jonah Thomas, um, he was born a week ago, and we brought him home from the hospital just two days ago. He literally came home for Christmas. Uh, I put this up there only, partially because I'm really proud of him and want you to know about him. Um, we're happy, we're excited, his two older brothers are super excited. But I put this up there for this reason, really. Uh, when you bring a baby home, if all goes as planned, if the baby's healthy, is mom, if mom is healthy, there is nothing quite like that in the world. If you're a parent, you probably remember that feeling you get when you hold that life in your hand, that, in your hands that God has entrusted to you. Or uh, when the baby first opens his or her eyes and you look into their eyes, they probably can't see you because they're not developed yet, but you think they do, and you just, you just fall in love. And you, you might remember that moment or the moment where their older siblings come in and their eyes light up because they see their new brother. Uh, there's just nothing like it. In those moments, it's so easy to see God's hand in things. It's so easy to see that God is obviously real, that God is obviously good to us, that God is obviously so generous with us. I hope, whether or not you've had an experience like that with a baby, I hope that you have had moments in your life where it seems like God is so obviously real and good and generous. The problem is, though, and I don't want to be Debbie Downer on Christmas, but here it goes, so I'll get him off the screen. Um, <laughs> the problem is that life isn't usually like that, is it? it? God's hand in the world is often difficult to see. At least for me, that's the way it is. Um, I look around the world, and you know, you turn the news on, and we look, and we hear stories of Aleppo, and we hear stories about what happened in Berlin just this past week, and we say to ourselves, where is God in this? Or, you know, forget about the news in the world, but just in your life. 
you look around at your friends and your family, uh, the struggles that they have, the pain that they're under, um, the conflict that they experience, uh, the disappointment with God that you hear about from them. Maybe even in your own life you feel that way. And you say to yourself, where is God in this? I bet we all feel this way at times. When things make us feel alone, when things make us feel like God is no longer protecting, no longer guiding us, when things make us feel as though God is distant. There are people who I know, and I'm jealous of these people, there are people who see God's hand in everything, even in the things that are bad. And it amazes me. I don't know if it's amazing faith or wishful thinking or a combination of both, but whatever it is, I, I don't have that. I honestly wish I did. I have a tendency to lean kind of the other way. I have a tendency to lean towards a more hands-off kind of image of God who sets the world in motion and then kind of lets his hand go and says, you know, have at it, guys. Let's see how you do. I wonder if I'm not alone in that way of thinking about God and the world. That God sometimes can seem distant. Or maybe you think that God feels like uninvolved in the day-to-day of your life. Maybe you're here at church this afternoon, but really what you're thinking is that God is just irrelevant for what you're going through. Maybe you think that so much so that you've just decided that you don't actually think God is real in the first place. The truth is, we all have these different images, these different ways of seeing God. We have a number of them that float around in our heads. Either the God that we believe in or the God that we know we don't believe in. And these images matter. It matters whether God is close to you and helpful or whether he's far and distant. It matters if God loves you regardless of who you are of what you've done or if God only loves you if you do the right things. These images matter matter. It's why every religion and every age and every culture across time seeks out who God really is in their own way. It turns out, you probably know this, that everyone seems to have very different images of who God really is. Even within the same religion, even in the same time period, the same church, the same room, the answers will vary. And John, the guy who wrote this, John gives us a very clear and simple reason as to why this is. And this is the way John puts it. He says, because, because, because no one has ever seen God. Just a few verses after this one, he says, no one has ever seen God. And in the absence of seeing God with our own two eyes, what happens is we seek or we stumble upon our own images of God. We all do this in various ways. We pick them up from culture. We pick them up from TV. We pick them up from what our parents taught us. Um, Someone like Freud would tell you that uh, we construct these images based on what our emotional need is. We pick them up from the kind of churches that we grow up in. We also just pick them up from the way we imagine we want God to be. Uh, We pick them up from all over the place. And I bet that you can... um, think of some of the more popular images of God that we have. And I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, We'll stick with with the Christmas theme. Uh, A lot of people imagine God as being like Santa Claus. You probably heard heard this before. Uh, He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. And I love that line, be good for goodness sake, because you could just hear the parent who wrote that line just exasperated at their child. Just be good for goodness sake. This, this, see, this image of God is one where he keeps tabs on you, where he maintains his naughty and nice list so that if you're good, you'll get good things. If you're bad, all you'll get is coal. And that's fine for Santa, but for God... I don't know, because under this image, the only reason you're good, then, is to get good things. This is obviously a cartoonish representation of this, but don't, don't we all find ourselves acting that way in reference to God sometimes? Just doing good, being good, trying to do good, because you get the feeling that God is watching? Or to stick with that Christmas theme, uh, what about the image of God as like a helper elf? 
This is the image of God that uh, is there just to serve our needs. You know, God, please get me a better parking space. God, I didn't study for that test. Please help me to get through this test. The helper elf God is there to get us through the times uh, where we need life to be a little easier, where we need something done for us. This is a God that we pull out of our pocket and we put to use whenever convenient. He's under our control. He's at our whim. There's another image of God that I'll call the nebulous, sort of ambiguous God. This is the God that is whoever you feel like God ought to be on that day. If you feel like you need to pick me up, then God is there to lift you up. Uh, if you feel like you need someone to tell you you're, do, you're doing super, God is there to tell you you're doing super. God is what you want him to be, depending on the day. This God is especially good at inspirational quotes on Facebook. There are, there are other gods, too. Countless other images of God that we have. You know, the God that's the puppet master that makes every single thing happen. Every heartbeat, every, every gust of wind is under God's control. And that means that he controls the good things and the horrible things. The other side, and that's where I kind of lean, is the God that kind of makes things happen and then pulls his hand back and says, let it go. And for as many people as are out there, that's how many different variations of uh, these images of God there are, because no one has ever seen God. And so we're left, as it seems, to figure it out ourselves. Except, except that John is not finished with, with, with his thought here. And what he has to say next is the absolute foundation of what Christians believe about God. And what does this have to do with Christmas? This has everything to do with Christmas. Look at how John continues uh, this line right here. It says, no one has ever seen God, but it is God the only Son. That's Jesus. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart and has made him known. John tells us that no one has ever seen God. No one really knows everything about God, except if you want to get to know God, then you got to get to know Jesus. Because Jesus shows us who God is. Jesus comes straight from the Father's heart, straight from the heart of God. Jesus shows us God's true self, God's true intention for us. Jesus shows us God fully. And finally, at his deepest death, depth, he shows us who God is. Because in a deep and mysterious sense, Jesus is God with us. You know that song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel? Um, that's taken from the Gospel of Matthew, where the angel refers to Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. So who then does Jesus show God to be? I want to give you two answers to this question. The first is sort of um, a cop-out answer, but it's really a good answer. Uh, the first answer, pick up a New Testament and read the stories about Jesus for yourself. If you need a Bible, if you need a New Testament, we have a bunch of them at the welcome desk. They're for you to take. If you want to know who God is, who Jesus shows God to be, pick up a New Testament and read the gospel stories. You will see it there. There are stories of Jesus healing sick people of raising the dead to life, healing the mentally ill. You see stories of Jesus eating with sinners, eating with uh, outcasts, eating with people who shouldn't ever be near someone holy. Jesus goes and eats with them. And what you see in those stories is a picture of a God who wants to bring you healing, of a God who wants to bring you life where there was no life, of a God who loves the unlovable and the unworthy and who includes the unincluded. If you read the New Testament, you'll read stories of, of, of a God who gives himself, who suffers for us, who dies on the cross and is raised from the dead to give us new life. And you see there a God who would rather die than go on without us. You see a God there who would rather enter into our human frailty, our sickness, become subject to our violence than he would give up on us. We see a God there who loves us so much that he would not withhold anything to save us, even his own son. That's who Jesus shows us this God to be. That's a good answer. 
That's not the answer I want to focus on, though. The answer I want to focus on today, it's, it's from right up there in that first line up there of who Jesus shows God to be. It completely captures the meaning of Christmas. Who is God? He is the God who has become human to make his home among us. You see it up there. To make his home among us. Not a distant God, not an ambiguous God, not a Santa Claus God who you see once a year. This is the God who is with us. And the key to unlocking what that means is in uh, what this would have meant to the original listeners of John's story. See, John was writing to a Jewish audience, and that term, uh, made his home among us, meant something very specific. It meant he lived among us, he dwelt among us, but uh, the old kind of religious word is that he tabernacled among us. Literally, it meant to pitch a tent among us. And for the Jewish listeners of this, this would have recalled for them the way that God lived with them during their journey from slavery in Egypt and through the wilderness towards the land that God promised them. You might remember these stories or know these stories uh, from the countless movies and uh, Prince of Egypt's and Ten Commandments that are all about this. On that journey and throughout their whole history, God made his home with them in a few very particular ways that I think illuminates for us what John means when he says that God makes his home among us with Jesus. The first way he does this is that God met his people, the Jewish people. God met them in a new and real and interactive way. They actually had a tent that was set up. It was a tent. They had tents tabernacling, you know, pitched a tent among us. They had a tent that was called the Tent of Meeting. And the purpose of this tent was that anyone who, who, who wanted to seek after God could go to the tent, and Moses, their leader, would speak to would speak with them, speak to God, and God would speak to Moses for them. And it actually says in Exodus that God would speak to Moses as one speaks to a friend. There is, uh, there's intimacy there. There's closeness there. God called upon Moses to do new things. Moses called upon God for help. Because God was there. His home was their home. They could know God in a way that they couldn't when God wasn't so present. God also protected them on that journey. He delivered them safely out of the hands of their enemies. You might remember the story of when uh, the Jewish people were escaping out of Egypt and the Egyptian army was bearing down on them and the Red Sea blocked their way to safety. And you, you probably remember this story from somewhere. Uh, God actually kind of sends cloud cover over them, uh, over the Egyptians, so that the Egyptians can't see where the Israelites are going, and then God opens the way through the Red Sea so that his people could escape uh, freely and clearly and safely. Because God was with them, because their home was God's home, he could protect them. He delivered them from what they needed deliverance from. And third, finally, on that journey, God guided them. He not only protected them, but he also showed them the way forward. He provided light for them to see in the penetrating dark of the wilderness. As they journeyed, God took the form of a pillar of cloud by day so they could see him, and a pillar of fire by night so that he could light the way forward when they couldn't see the way forward. Because God was with them in that way, that was real and tangible, God could direct them as only light in the darkness could direct them. God met them, he interacted with them, he protected them, he guided them. When John writes that the word, God, has become human and makes his home among us in Jesus, he is saying that God has come in human form because God wants to have this kind of relationship with you. Where God makes his home with you, where he's close with you, where there's intimacy with you, where God speaks with you and you speak with God where God protects you, where God gives you strength for the things where you feel weak, where God gives you perseverance to get through your suffering, where God accompanies you on the journey that you're on, where he guides you, he lights the way forward. Listen, I, 
I don't know what your darkness is. I don't know what your wilderness is. I don't know what threatens you. But couldn't you use this sort of God with you? Not at a distance, but at home, in here, with you. When John describes God in this way, coming to us in the birth of Jesus, God becoming human, he is saying this, this is who God is. The God who wants a relationship with you. Not a God who keeps track of your naughty and nice and uh, all that. Forget about that. God wants to know you and to be known by you. Not because you're good or bad, but because you were made for this relationship with him. Because you were made to know God and to be loved by him. Because he loves you regardless of what list you're on. This is who God is. Not a God who merely wants to help you find parking or uh, pass your tests. God is a God who wants to accompany you every day. Who truly knows what you need. Who truly knows what you need protection from. Who truly knows how to free you from the things that you need to be freed from. This is who God is. He's not ambiguous. He's not nebulous. He's not unreliable. He's not someone who's made up according to our imaginations. God is a God who became human, who was willing to get into the mess of our lives, who was not willing to remain at a distance, but was intent on coming near to you. God is a God who is faithful to you, who's unwavering in his care for you, who wants to be your rock, the very ground on which you stand. We all have these different images of God, and pieces of them might be true or not true here and there. But when we open the New Testament, when we get a look at Jesus, we find a God who from his heart, from the core of his being, we find a God who wants, who wants to know you, who wants you to know him, who wants a relationship with you because he loves you, who wants to make his home with you, in, your, in you, in your heart, who doesn't seem to rest until he finds you. As the angel says in Matthew, this is Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. So what, what, what can you do in response to this God becoming human at Bethlehem? One thing you can do, one thing you can do is nothing. You can choose to ignore it. You can choose to respond as if none of it is true and continue to go on with any kind of image of God that floats around in your head. You can do this but I would caution you not to. Because what if, what if this is actually true? What if God actually did become human on that very first Christmas? What if God actually loves you so much to do that for you, to step out of heaven and to be born in that dirty manger at Bethlehem for you? What if it was true? And if it is, it's the most important thing to ever happen in the history of the world. What if it was true and you did nothing about it? If it's true and you did nothing about it, then I don't know what to tell you other than consider the boat missed. This is the thing that you were made for. The thing that God came into this earth as Jesus for. But I can't convince you of that truth. That's something that only God can do. But for you here that are unsure, for you that are barely, if all, believing for those of you who want to believe but can't quite bring yourself to believe, the one thing that I can say you can do, and it's simple, it's give this God a chance to show you. Let Jesus show you who God is rather than all of those other images that you've, that you've taken in so far. I would stake my entire self on this claim that if you get a look at Jesus and Jesus is actually God with us, then you won't be able to help but come to believe in him and want to know him and follow him too. If that's you, then this new year, try. Just try it. Try returning to church. This church or another church, wherever you feel at home. Try returning to scripture and seeing this Jesus for yourself. Try being with people who are Jesus' followers and, and who can help you uh, follow him too. On the other end of the spectrum, for those of you who are sure what you believe, 
you're the confident, weathered Christians who are saying to yourself, I've heard this before, I know what Christmas is all about, I know who God is. If that is the case, then why sometimes does our faith not show that? I say this to myself as well. Why does it seem like it's a Santa Claus faith sometimes, where we're good only because God is watching us? Why does, why does God become whoever we need him to be in the moment? Why do we act as if God is distant? Why, why are our prayers so small? Why are our prayers only about parking spaces and test scores and blessing meals when in fact he's the Lord of the universe who can move mountains and has created this whole thing? For all of us, sure or unsure, faith-filled or just failed in faith, let Jesus into your home, into your heart. Let him be the God who is, who is with us to accompany you in the journey that you're on to guide you, to protect you, to free you, to light up the path before you, to have a real and living and dynamic relationship with him. Whatever it is that's in the way of that relationship, push it aside so that he can come in and make his home with you. This is what God wants for you for Christmas. This is what God wants wants for you for your life, to make room for him to move into your home, into your heart, into your life, and to change things forever there. Let's pray that God would do that. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for coming into this earth, being born in the manger of Bethlehem as a baby, for coming to be our God, our God with us. We thank you for coming to know us, to speak with us, to interact with us, to guide us, to protect us. We pray, Lord, that you would form that relationship with us more and more. That for those of us here who want, who want that or feel called to that, that you would speak to us. Lord, that you would convince us of who you are. That you would make yourself more and more real to us every day so that you're not irrelevant or so that you're not uninvolved, but so that you are the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would bless this community, bless this time together, this celebration of you coming into this, into this world at Christmas time. We pray, Lord, that you would shed light onto us now as we sing and we celebrate your birth among us in the little town of Bethlehem. We thank you for making this home a place where you dwell with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.